in the beginning of the book of Acts, here uh, in Acts chapter 2, we read the words, it begins with these words, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now this is Luke writing the book of Acts. He has written Luke, he continues with the record of the book of Acts. It's one continuous revelation, actually, we've said before. Luke and Acts go together. So if wherever you decide, I'm going to read the Gospels. Start with Luke, and then skip John and go to, to the book of Acts, because that's the way it should be read. So Luke is not simply pointing out that a particular feast day had arrived. We know that the day of Pentecost here in the English is Shavuot, the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, the feast that comes 50 days after Passover. So he doesn't just mean that a particular feast day had arrived as it had before over a, a thousand years. Remember, the Lord gave the feasts when they were coming out of Egypt in Exodus. So for, for centuries they had celebrated this particular day. It would came year after year, year after year. Luke isn't just saying and it was Pentecost again. He's saying something more. He is pointing out that the day on that day was a day on which something momentous would occur. That day had come. Something momentous would happen, and that day had come. Something that had been prophesied by God would be fulfilled. Something that would set in motion the events of the last days. Think about that. Whatever happened that Pentecost, that Shavuot, set in motion the events of the last days. Something that would require a response from the people of Israel and the world. That, as we have just read, was the pouring out of the Spirit. Well, as we have read before, we didn't read it now, but as we've read it before, is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Peter speaks to the people by the Holy Spirit to explain to them what has happened because they're accusing them of being drunk. Peter says, no, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Nobody is drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. It doesn't happen. So let me tell you what this is all about. Now, in a nutshell, Peter says, what is happening here today in Jerusalem on this Shavuot is similar to something that will happen at the end of the age. Similar to something that will happen at the end of the age. And to show that, he quotes the prophet Joel. He quotes the prophet Joel, who prophesied about the day of the Lord. We read the prophet Joel here in one of our evening services. The entire book, the, the book of the prophet Joel, is about the day of the Lord, the restoration of Israel, and the establishment of the kingdom of God in Israel at the end of the age. But Peter is saying, What's going to happen in the future at the end of the age? This is similar to it. This is similar to it. He explains that Jesus Christ, whom they rejected and crucified, was the promised king of Israel. All of this we read before from Acts 2. He was the promised king of Israel. He was the son of David, the son of God. God has raised him from the dead, Peter explains, and exalted him to his right hand, now waiting to return to restore all things. He quotes a psalm in which the psalmist writes that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father, waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. Do you remember that? Why is Jesus up in heaven? He's waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. So he's explaining all this, it's the restoration of all things, he says. He explains that he is the one, Jesus, he is the one who poured out his spirit as a sign that the restoration of Israel has begun. The people understand that. These are all Jews, the Jewish people. This is a festival day. Everybody that is there is Jew. Jewish males, many other who are not Jews from the nations are there as well. But it is mainly the people of Israel who are there. And they hear this, they understand what has, what has transpired in the past three years, especially with the events of the last 50 days. P 
Peter has made an explanation, given a clear explanation. And so they understand so clearly that in verse 37, the people ask. Rather, they, it says that they were cut to the heart. When you're cut to the heart because you just heard something, you really understood what you've heard, right? It is a dramatic effect, a powerful effect in the heart of those who have heard Peter explain what it means that they're speaking in different languages and the ones who are listening uh, recognize their language and they hear and understand what is being said and they glorify God for this awesome miracle. Peter says, all of this that you see is this that is happening. They understand about Jesus and so they hear that. They understand it clearly. They, they are cut to the depth of their being and so they ask, what? do we do? What do we do? Because we understand everything as you have explained it. And so, of course, Peter answers, repent. Repent. Return. Turn and return. And, of course, it's return to God, to the God of Israel. Return to the commandments of the Torah. And to prove that, to confirm that, be baptized like John was doing three years earlier. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus the Christ. Not just for the washing of sins, uh, uh, not just for, uh, as a ritual to, to symbolically, symbolically show cleansing, but removal of sins. You will receive the gifts of your Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because the promise is to you. Because what has happened here is all in reference to you, what is yours, what is your inheritance, what you have from God. And not only you, but your children, not just the children that you have here, the ones that will come after you generations, and not just those, but those outside of Israel, as many as the Lord will call. He goes on to say in verse 38. So that's what's happening in Acts 2. Now historically, it has been taught in every Christian denomination that the event that took place that day, they read, now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they read that, and they say, okay, here it is. We're going to begin to see the beginning of the Christian church. The birth of the Christian church and Christianity. This is what has been taught. It was taught that God rejected Israel and Christians were the new people and the new witnesses of God concerning the gospel. The gospel proclaimed by the Christian church changed from the gospel of the kingdom. It went from the gospel of the kingdom exclusively to becoming exclusively the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we understand, when we say the gospel of the kingdom here, we know we're talking about Jesus Christ. We know that. We know that it's part and parcel of the whole message. That You can't separate the two. But afterwards, it became exclusively the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the kingdom became vague, not easily described. And then later on it was described, and it certainly wasn't what God had said for centuries. Not long after the death of that first generation of believers, that doctrine or this doctrine would become deadly for the people of Israel. It would become deadly that this was the birth of the church, that doctrine, that this was the birth of the church and Christianity, the birth of new witnesses. It became deadly for the people of Israel. Christian doctrine would emphasize, emphasize the fact of Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ as king. Is that true that Israel rejected Jesus Christ as king as a nation? It's true. They did. It's a fact. God said that they would. God said that they would. But it's emphasized, it was emphasized in a particular way. Yes, they rejected Jesus as king, but they went as far as convicting all Jews of killing. Jesus Christ. They would become known as the Christ killers for the centuries. Even today, you will still hear that accusation. As far as everyone is concerned who uses it, they have been convicted of it. And this is who they are. Now, long after the death of that first generation, this doctrine, I've read it already, I'm sorry. It would provide, this doctrine would provide justification for centuries of animosity toward Jews, beginning with animosity. And then it would always lead to persecution. It would never remain just animosity. It would always lead to persecution. It would lead to violence. And ultimately, it would lead to death. 
wherever, wherever they were found in the world. Wherever they were found in the world. There was no place on the planet safe for Israel after they were scattered from the land. It became ingrained in the souls of the people all over the world. And as we learned last week on the video that we saw, this continued as church policy, policy in Roman Catholicism until the 1800s, meaning they wrote it into law. They passed out what is called what? Encyclical, something like that. Sent it out to all the corners of the world where Catholicism reigned supreme everywhere. And everyone was instructed, this is what you do as policy. And this is how you speak as law and as rule. This is what you do. One from the very top, straight from the top, in reference to Israel and to the Jew. It was a matter of church policy and Catholicism until the late 1800s. But it wasn't limited to Catholicism. Every denomination is infected with anti-Jewish sentiment to some degree. In our day, it is growing rapidly across the world, and it's growing rapidly among Christians. We're recovering the true gospel sent from God because for the believer, for the believer, the one who calls himself a Christian, the follower of Jesus, where the nation of Israel is concerned, there is only one sentiment, one feeling, one position, one stance that is acceptable to God and Jesus Christ. And why do we want to know that? Because they're the only two that matter. They're the only two that matter. God and Jesus, what they think. And what is that stance? What is that sentiment? What is that position? It is love. Love. Love for Israel. Love for the Jew. Love for the Israelite. Love for the Hebrew. But love for Israel for the sake of God's name. That changes it. For the sake of God's name and for the sake of Jesus the Christ. That's why. You are to love the Jew. That's why I am to love the Jew, the Israelite, the Hebrew, the people, the land. Why do most Christians have no love for Israel? Because it's a fact that most don't. Why? Because of our teachers. Because of our teachers. The seeds of anti-Jewish sentiment were planted in Christians, and what is sown is that which is reaped. Now, we're not just going to pass, you know, lay it, at, lay it all at their feet because we don't have to receive what is given us. But largely that is the truth. We heard it from someone. Somebody commented. Somebody said. Somebody declared. We watched actually a full length, maybe a video presentation, a sermon on those Jews, on the evil Jew, on the cursed Jew. And maybe we, we didn't necessarily took, took, took it all in, but the seed was planted. And that's all you need to do is hear something, and it's there. And it's there. And it will grow. And it will grow. And what has grown through the centuries is anti-Israel sentiment. On one level, just feelings. On the other, le on the other level, of the extreme actions against them. Again, to varying degrees, this is history. This is history. In Matthew chapter 7, go ahead and turn over there. Let me tell you why this is important. We spoke about it just briefly last Sunday. But let's look at it a little closer from Matthew. Jesus himself teaching. Keep in mind bearing fruit. Keep in mind trees. Keep in mind branches. Because this is all biblical symbolism, biblical uh, imagery used to designate people leaders, nations, trees, fruit-bearing. So in Matthew 7, beginning at verse 13, Jesus, of course, is teaching. If I can just find my place here. He continues, because it's, a, it's, it's one continuous teaching, Toward the end of it, he says, Enter by the narrow gate. Enter by the narrow gate. 
For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by it, go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets, false teachers, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we ha have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus is teaching. He is teaching fellow Jews. So he's talking about things that they understand. He's talking about, he's talking out of their history. He's talking out of the words of the prophets, because that's all he can teach out of, the words of the prophets. Remember, he says, I only say the things that my father has said, and the words of the prophets are the things that the father has said. And Jesus, being the son of God, sent to speak the words of God, speaks out of the prophets, speaks the truth, speaks the things that are already understood to be the truth. And so he's teaching them, what is, what is his message to them? His message is the gospel of the kingdom, right? The kingdom has come. Repent, believe in the gospel. Is he, saying, is he preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? No, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, but he's pointing, up, he's pointing to himself as the one through whom the kingdom comes and the one through whom you enter the kingdom. Yes? That's true. That's true for them, the Jews. It's true for us. But he says, enter in by the narrow gate. He begins, enter in by the narrow gate. Because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go by it. Because the narrow gate is difficult. Because narrow is the gate rather than and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. So he's teaching them, he's teaching them very carefully and he's speaking to them very, very specifically. He tells them the truth. The gospel that I'm preaching to you, it's not an easy gospel. It's not one that you're going to run toward and say, Oh my God, look at all this. Everything that I've ever wanted is in this gospel. It just makes everything wonderful and beautiful. I'm so glad that God has come and given us this really, really great news. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm telling you something that you're going to have to, that you're going to enter in with great difficulty. But I am telling you, enter in through this narrow gate, this very difficult road. Take this difficult road. Yes? This is what he's saying. There's another way. It's wide. It's full of, full of things, full of words from God, full of, full of promises from God, but it isn't the right gate. It's a wide gate. It doesn't lead to the right place. It doesn't lead to the kingdom. Many are going there because it is wide, because it is easy, because it is appealing because it's desirable and there's many on there that are egging you on to take it but I'm telling you enter through the narrow gate it's a difficult one it has it is has great difficulty and very few will find it very few will find it he says be careful of false teachers because false teachers don't always, don't tell you the truth they always they just tell you what you want to hear isn't that true? That's what makes a false teacher a false teacher. He's a teacher. Teachers everywhere. The difference between a false one and a true teacher is the false will tell you what you want to hear because he wants something from you. He wants to lead you. He doesn't want to lead you into truth. He leads you into the, in, in the way that you can, he can take that what he wants from you. So beware of false teachers, he says. How will you be able to tell what a teacher is false or true? Now remember, keep in mind that their frame, of res their frame of reference for all that they're hearing from Jesus is their history, their kingdom, the plans and purposes of God for them. It's about entering the kingdom. It's about finding your place in the household of God where you are supposed to be, where you belong because you are an Israelite, a, a son of Abraham, because you are a, a member of the covenant people. 
This is all familiar to them. Nothing new, nothing strange. Into the kingdom. Come in. I'm the one. I'm the door. It's not easy. It's very difficult if you find it. I'm telling you the truth. If you choose to, to, if you make the decision that you are going to pursue the kingdom and enter the kingdom, you're not going to just skip through the doors. You're going to struggle. It's going to cost you. And he's presenting himself, of course, as a true teacher. And so he says, beware of false teachers. How will you know them? You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by what their lives demonstrate as the fruit of their teachings. Good fruit comes only from a good tree. And it gives them a very simple illustration, very simple understanding. Good fruit comes only from a good tree. You can't have bad fruit come from a good tree. A tree bearing bad fruit can only be cut down and burned. The prophet that is speaking false teachings, false words, his end is destruction. If you follow him, them, that's your destiny as well. And of course, the fruit here is always the, the result of the works of the Torah, the works of the law. That's the good fruit that you bear. That's the fruit that is good from God's point of view. And everything that the Torah speaks of and teaches and exhorts the follower to do. If the fruit isn't there, then it's a bad tree. If the fruit rather isn't good, it's a bad tree. It's going to be burned. So don't follow that because you're going to burn with it. And then he says, he, he puts it all together and says, you need to be careful because many many are going to be deceived, or they are self-deceived. In verse 21, <clears throat> many are self-deceived. Self-deceived. It's something that we and I, that we do ourselves. We come to a place where we have to make a decision, where we have to make a choice. The truth has been presented to us, and it's obvious that this is the truth, and it's obvious that this is the lie. And then for, some, for, some, for, for a reason within ourselves, we choose the lie, knowing clearly that it is that the lie and the truth has been put before us. We choose the lie. We deceive ourselves into thinking that what we've chosen is the truth. Many, he says, are like this. Many who have heard the truth and have heard the lie choose the lie. They are self-deceived, but they believe they're serving God. They still believe they're serving God, but in reality, they are lawless, meaning they are outside of the Torah. They are denying, rejecting, turning their face away from the reality, the truth that has been revealed in the Word of God from the very beginning from Moses to the day that Jesus here is teaching. They are lawless. They think they're serving God, but in reality, they're lawless. God knows they're lawless. They are lawless. They're not aware that they are lawless. They're going to find out on the day of judgment. This is a very sobering teaching from Jesus. Sobering. That you can, lead, you can be deceived your entire life. You can think that you're serving God because of many things that you do, and you think that to be the fruit of serving God when in reality, you're lawless and you won't know it until you are resurrected from the dead. You come before the presence of the Lord on judgment day and the Lord will pronounce the judgment. Depart from me. And that person will struggle and cry and weep. But Lord, I did this, 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 and this. I cast out demons. I did all kinds of things for you in your name. No. No, you didn't. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Meaning, you didn't do it one time or two. This was your lifestyle. You did it as a form of lifestyle. It's, it's, this is so sobering. It is so sobering that, that Jesus puts it so clearly, so plainly for us to understand that the Lord has done all that he has done and all that he can do to bring to us the truth, to reveal it to us. He gives us the help of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to understand. 
But now there is your decision. Now the choice that you're going to make. Are you going to listen to what the Spirit is saying, to what, what the Lord has spoken, to what He has declared? Or are you going to deceive yourself and continue your own way? Because you can. You can do it. I can do it. I have the option. And everyone that is going to be in the kingdom will be in the kingdom because of repentance and humility and humbling ourselves under the, the mighty hand of God, recognizing the lordship of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ, having nothing to be able to say but to fall on our face and appeal to the mercy of God and to the compassion of the Lord and ask him to save us. And he does, and he, we come in, and we enter the kingdom. That's how you come in. There are those who are deceived, self-deceived, and will, will think that they have entered and will do things that they think are pleasing to the Lord and Jesus who uh, will act in ways that they feel God is approving of and yet they will die in their self-deception and it is on judgment day that they will encounter the living God and meet their folly. We don't want to be those. We are striving to become trees of God's planting. Remember the, the, the imagery last Sunday about the, the tree, how Israel became a corrupt vine. It, was, it has the best stock, the highest quality seed, but it perverted. Can that happen to you and to me? It, it can because it happened to the Christian church through the centuries. It perverted and, came and became the worst enemy of the people of God. And rather than demonstrating the love of Jesus that it claims as its head, this is the Christian church, rather than demonstrating the love of Jesus that it claims is its head. We are the body. Jesus is our head. We move in the, in the world in the name of Jesus. We are the manifest presence of God in the world. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus in the world. This is all that is that you hear. This is what you hear about Christians and the Christian church. But the fruit, the main one, the one that determines for God whether we really understand and believe and accept his lordship and his and Jesus and his his the purpose for his coming is our treatment of Israel our treatment of the Jew our thoughts and sentiments and feelings about the Jew and Israel and the land and Jerusalem and the book everything we want to become trees of God's planting who bear the fruit of God's word. We want God, who is the gardener, to prune us so that we can bear the fruit that God that glorifies him and Jesus Christ, who is the vine. From John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remember? And God is the gardener. That's just the way it is. And God looks at the branches that are coming from the vine, Jesus, and what isn't producing good fruit, he prunes. He prunes so that it can bear much fruit and so that that fruit can remain. That happens while you're alive on this side of the grave. And we can co-labor with God in order for that to happen. You resist God, God lets you alone until the day of judgment and then you're a tree cut down. And you're good only for the burning. And we're good only for the burning. Do we understand all of these images? This is so, so, so important, so graphic. It's good that it is. But we, we can now properly connect it to what God is thinking about and what Jesus is thinking about and what the testimony of the Scriptures are declaring. God has demonstrated His faithful love to Israel, His, His unchanging faithfulness. And when He reveals Himself to a, a Gentile, it is to impart to them exactly the same thing. It's impossible not to receive from God the heart of God. And then you cultivate it. And then you cultivate it, and then you cultivate it until that heart grips you in, in your entirety, and you become someone, as, that is, as is the desire of God, who will co-labor with him and his Holy Spirit to bring his people Israel to jealousy, to provoke them to jealousy, and bring them to God through Jesus Christ, through Jesus the Christ. We've talked about this so much. We need to understand that these are the days in which God is working specially, specially powerfully 
in the body of Christ to trim, to prune, to prune it, to make it the tree that he intends for it to be, that will bear the proper fruit, the ideal fruit, the, the fruit being, being faithful love, love for his glorious name, for Jesus' name, the glory that will be the highest glory when Israel returns to him. And so we are the co-laborers of God, gone into the, into the field to bring back a harvest. Israel first, the Jew first, and then the nations. Now, what do you, how do you get a heart like this? I'm going to tell you the truth. You're not going to get it if you're always reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the book of Revelation. Understand that. You're never going to come to a place where a seed is sown in your heart that will grow, that will blossom and bear the fruit of love toward Israel for love of God and Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen. You need to go to the prophets. You need to go to Genesis, to Malachi, spend a lot of time in the prophets. That's why we're doing what we're doing here. This is why this is blank. You know why this is blank over here? Look at the, look at the, the timeline. You know why that's blank? Because that represents the birth of Jesus. The, the very last picture, the very last picture there, is the birth of Jesus and then all Christian history. And we want to not focus on any of that yet so that we can focus on all that we don't know. Because in our mind, all of that is really blank. Right? And all of this is full of pictures of Christianity. All of them, all of them, all of them, and I'm not going to say all of them, most of them, false pictures, false photographs, false images, false concepts. And over there, it's all blank. And it's impossible for us to make the changes and the adjustments and have the Lord renew our minds if we don't know all of this. And if you don't read the prophets, you're always going to see all of this. This traditional, that is man-made, that keeps producing fruit that is not the fruit that God desires. Faithful love to God and love that is expressed in the desire to see Israel restored to him. And that happens when we read the prophets. So I want to do something with us because this is something that we're doing regularly and we need to do it. But I want us to see this because there's nothing so powerful than reading a large, large section of scripture that just keeps talking about the same thing and paints a, and paints a clear picture of the plans and the purposes of God. And this is what you find in Ezekiel 35, 36, and 37. <clears throat> and if you want to do something that will change your heart, change your mind, read these three chapters over and over throughout the week. And this is not just the only place, of course, but this is a section in the Word of God. But I want you to notice what a big section it is. How much God says. How much God declares. How He says it in the many different forms that He says it. And if at the end of reading these chapters you still disagree with God that Israel should be loved, loved, and that you should desire to see them come to God, and you still argue with that, then of course it means that there's a stronghold in your life. There's a demonic stronghold in your life. It's planted by false teachers. Planted by false teachers. Because when God saves a person, when Jesus came into the heart of an individual, he gave them love, to the Jew, for the Jew first, and then for the nations. It doesn't mean that there's a greater love for Israel and a lesser love for the nations. No, it's the proper order, the proper order, the order that demonstrates, oh, we see what you see, Lord. I understand what you understand, God. I know what it is that you're trying to do in the world, Lord. This is how you're going to accomplish the restoration of all things. And so you give yourself whole, wholeheartedly wholeheartedly to that which God is wholeheartedly committed to. God is wholeheartedly committed to saving his people, Israel. He is wholeheartedly committed to it. And if you and I are not that, then God is going this way and you and I are going that way. Or he's going that way and you're going this way. And that's not good. Because the best thing that could happen to you and to me is that I keep in step with God. I keep in step with the Holy Spirit. I hear what God 
says and I say what he says. That way we're like Jesus. I see what God is doing and I do what God is doing. That's why we're like Jesus. This is how he said it. So turn to Ezekiel 35. And follow along as I read. and Get involved. And by that I mean get really into the words. Don't just let your mind wander. Forget about lunch for a little bit. Okay? Lunch is going to be there. I know we have pressing things. I'm going to try to do this as smooth and as, as fast and as smooth as I can. But we'll follow along and, and get into the heart of God. Remember, Israel is scattered. They're in Babylon. They're destroyed. They are destroyed. They are at the bottom. They're nothing. They're slaves. The land is a mess. He has, he has annihilated his kingdom, but he's not going to forget them. He's going to restore them. And he's talking about how he's going to do that. And this is God. This is not Ezekiel. This is God talking. So follow along. 35, 36, and 37. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it, and say to it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you. Now, this is the, this is the most terrible thing that a human can hear from God. I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you and make you most desolate. I shall lay your cities waste and you shall be desolate. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Why would God do this? Because you have had an ancient hatred that ha and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword at the time of their calamity when their iniquity came to an end. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood and blood shall pursue you, since you have not hated blood. Therefore, blood shall pursue you. Thus I will make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut off from it the one who leaves and the one who returns. And I will fill its mountains with the slain. On your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines, those who are slain by the sword shall fall. I will make you perpetually desolate, and your cities shall be uninhabited then. You shall know that I am the Lord. Because you have said, you spoke, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will do according to your anger and according to the envy which you showed in your hatred against them, I will make myself known among them when I judge you. I'm going to repay you. I'm going to give back to you what you're giving out, right? I'm going to dish out to you what you're dishing out. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies, which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel, sayest, saying, this is what you said, they are desolate. They're given to us to consume. Thus, now listen to verse 13. Thus, in this way, with your mouth, you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. I have heard. Included there is them. I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord God, the whole earth will rejoice when I make you desolate as you rejoice because of the inheritance of the house of Israel was desolate. So I will do to you. You shall be desolate, O Mount Seir, as well as all of Edom, all of it then they shall know <clears throat> that I am the Lord. <clears throat> and you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. We read this yesterday. No, Saturday. Yes, yesterday. Did we? Yesterday? <clears throat> Excuse me. Talk to the mountains. Now, now think about what, what God is telling Ezekiel to do. Now, he's in Babylon, so he can't walk all the way down to to Israel and go talk to a mountain, but we know, we understand. Talk to the land. I want you to say something to the land, the geography of Israel, the topography of the Israel. Talk to the mountains and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy has said of you, the land, the ancient heights have become our possession because somebody has laid claim to the land. Therefore prophesy and says, Thus saith the Lord God, because they made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side, 
so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations, and you are taken up by the lips of talkers and slandered by the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, God, speaking to the land, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the desolate waste, and the cities that have been forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Surely I have spoken in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who gave my land to themselves. They took it who gave my land to themselves as possession with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds in order to plunder its open country. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my fury because you have borne the shame of the nations. This is what God thinks about when he sees other nations taking possession of his land and trampling on it as if it is just another piece of real estate. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath that surely the nations that are all around you shall bear their own shame. They're going to pay for it. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. The people of Israel understand this about the land. The land is theirs by inheritance and the land of Israel only flourishes for the Jew. This is historically true. This is God saying it here. That land is only for the feet, the souls of the Jew, the Israelite, the northern and the southern kingdoms together. It's going to bear fruit my people, Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed, I am for you, and I will return to you, and you shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited, inhabited, and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply you, man and multiply upon you, man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel uses more than any other prophet this phrase. He will describe something that he will do, God. And then he says, because of that, that I will do. Then that group, that nation, that people will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel is talking about the ways in which God is going to show himself to all the world that he is the Lord. Yes, verse 12, I will cause men to walk on you, my people Israel. They shall, they shall take possession of you, and you shall be their inheritance. You shall be the inheritance of my people Israel. No more shall you bereave them of children, thus saith the Lord God, because they say to you, you devour men <coughs> and bereave your nation of children. Therefore, you shall devour men no more, nor bereave your nation any more, saith the Lord nor will I let you hear the taunts of the nations anymore, nor bear the reproach of the peoples anymore, nor shall you cause your nation to stumble anymore, saith the Lord God. Moreover, the word of the Lord said, came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Because of that, I poured out my fury on them for the blood that they had shed on the land for their idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. They made it common. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name. Here is the name of God. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. You remember somebody else that had concern for the name of God in history? An individual, a character that had concern for God's name, what the nations would think of his name? Who was that? Do you remember? Moses. 
Moses. So we can have the heart of God that we are concerned for his name just like he says here that he's concerned for his name. I had concern for my holy name which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not do this for you. Is God gathering Israel for them, for their sake? No, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever they went, wherever you went. And I will make holy, sanctify my great name, which has been made common among the nations, which you have made common in their midst, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I am sanctified, seen as holy in your eyes. Before them, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, I'll put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my Holy Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my commandments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your field, so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were no good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake do I do this, saith the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled, instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me, inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like a, the flock at Jerusalem on its feast days. So shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones, speak to them and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. And the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. Thus saith the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. 
They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it, For Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write on it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, then join them to one another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their king, their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt and they shall dwell there they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel, set them apart, make them holy, when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Wow. What an awesome awesome vision. It's an impossible vision. Impossible. Except for God, who can do it who wants to do it. Israel wants it, except they want it in their own way. They want to come to the land and do their own thing. And they want to live among the nations and do whatever they want to do as a nation, apart from God. Yes, they'll call upon his name. Yes, they'll talk about the Torah. Yes, they'll talk about their heritage and their culture and their history and their right to the land and all those things. But they have said it. They have said it. The leadership have said it. We won't. We won't follow the God of Israel. It costs too much to do that. But what does God say here? He's going to do it. He's going to accomplish it. He has to accomplish it. It has to be done. Why? For his name's sake. You want to honor God? You want to serve God? You want to worship God? You want to feel that you're serious about God? That you're close to God? That God is close to you? that you're devoted to him, that this should be your desire and my desire, the glory of his name. The fact that Israel has profaned his name among the nations, the fact that his name is common in the world, the fact that he is a God among the gods of the nations, 
and that cannot be because God has made a name for himself in world history and Israel has profaned it and we have with our treatment of Israel have profaned it as well the Lord is going to recover his holy name and those that do not participate with him in the recovery of his name he will cut off he's going to cut off a bunch of his own people Israel in the next chapter as a matter of fact he talks about how he's going to do that separating the goats from the sheep in Israel the rebels take them out of his people Israel I will purge the rebels from among you he tells them if he's going to do that to his people Israel he's going to do that in the body in the so-called body of Christ in the so-called church in the world because what matters is the glory of his great name the fact that he went down to Egypt and took out slaves and promised them to plant them in a land that he would give them and they they would become the delight a delight in the world that would speak of his glory of his holiness of his righteousness of his justice of all that is good and perfect that people would speak of that and it hasn't happened it hasn't happened and the name of the Lord is common in the world God is jealous for his name he is zealous for his name and the way to exalt it to the highest place is to keep his promises to Abraham Isaac and Jacob to have a holy people established in the land that God reserved for Abraham Isaac and Jacob and make them his kingdom in the world you want to work with God you want to work with Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit this is what they're doing this is what they're doing that been doing since the very beginning and today God calls us to that to be involved with God in this we need his heart the words of the prophets and the teachings of John the Baptist Jesus and the Apostles will give us the heart of God as we continue in our study here of, of this all this history we're not learning knowledge we're not getting facts we're not getting dates we want God to give us his heart we want God to give us the heart of Jesus that led him to the cross for the joy set before him Jesus saw the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim united he saw them being brought from the nations cleansed of all their filthiness of all their idols of all their idolatry and and filthy involvement with the gods of the nations of all their desire to be away from God and not see God at all he's going to cleanse them of all of that purify Israel and bring her to himself if we love God we love Israel because we know that Israel for God is his glory it doesn't make us any less we always have to remind ourselves it does not make us any less what an awesome what an awesome thought it is that we are those who God reached out into the nations and brought us to himself and then equipped us to go and find his son Ephraim and Judah and to bring them back to himself the Apostle Paul who talks about going to places that the gospel had never been preached he wanted to go to places where the gospel had never been preached because he wanted to sanctify the offering of the Gentiles and among those Gentiles were the sons of the northern kingdom Ephraim the tribes bringing them back to God bringing them back to God this is this is why a uh, Paul could go around the world three times suffer as he did and then go to his death letting them letting the Romans remove his head I've done what I was called to do to go to the nations and plant the seeds of the gospel of the kingdom of God so that Jew so that the Jew and so that the the, the Ephraimite the northern tribes could be brought back to God we don't know what all of this means we don't know the implications of all of this we're learning that we're praying that you will be praying that God would help us understand what all this implies because this is the labor of the last days this is the spiritual labor of these the last days before Jesus Christ returns this is how you know that the fruit you're bearing is good fruit because this is the seed that God plants in you and in me his seed the one that bears love that bears the fruit of love for wayward Israel for lost Israel 
and the return of that people is the highest glory for God. We serve the Lord because we love him because he first loved us. We don't serve the Lord because of what we get from him. He already, we already have all things from him. We serve the Lord because we want his glory. We want his name to be lifted up to the place that it belongs. In the heart of all, all who see him to know that he is the Lord. Let's stand.